All right. All right. All right. All right. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Good evening, saints. I'm glad you made it. And we give God the glory. Praise the Lord. Yes, let's have a word of prayer. We lift our hands in your name and we thank you for another day that you have graced us with. We don't live by bread alone, but we are living. And we're living by every word that proceedeth out of your mouth. And we give you the glory today, Lord, because you have called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Be among your people as we go into the depths of your word to hear what you have to say and to see what you have for us to see. And we will thank you for that and give your name praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. And why don't you just clap your hands and give the Lord an offering. Just go on and clap your hands and give the Lord an offering, an offering of praise. All right. Well, we're in the middle of an amazing uh, study that I believe is God sent. The theme for this year is um, this is the year to run, 2021. And now we've run all the way through March. And here we are in April, and we're running with renewed strength. This is also the year of the word, the year of the word. And it's already working. It's already producing evidence and fruit. In recent weeks, we've been studying the New Testament in ways of more effectively studying the word of the Lord. Uh, I call it studying to study. We've been studying the most effective ways to study God's word, first the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And All right, I said I got my back up. I got my back up. Back up, just in case. I got two devices because we're getting ready to go a little further. I was saying we were especially blessed to hear Sister Williams on last Thursday give us the introduction to basic um, investing, stock market, and uh, the whole concept of long term benefits from solid principles of investing. Uh, she's going to return as our study will resume on that next Wednesday. And for three Wednesdays in a row, um, she's going to walk through what is a study entitled Investment for the Saints. Um, while we're preparing for that um, 
a loaded April study that will resume on next Wednesday. Uh, I want to I want to ask you a few questions about an interesting person who had a unusual unusual record of gaining, losing, and regaining. And I want you to get ready to do some work on this with us. Uh, before we go to uh, St. Matthew's Gospel um, in chapter 26 of Matthew, I want you to, I want you to start out with a testimony. And um, I would like for you to um, consider what is good about God in your life. What is good about God in your life? He is good. And we give thanks unto the Lord because he is good and his mercy endureth forever. But I want you just to take a few moments in the meditation aspect of where we're going to go for the next hour or so and specify something good you've experienced about God. You've experienced it in his word. You've experienced in your study. You've experienced it in your testimony. You've experienced this in your um, witness. You've experienced this in your growth. Uh, you've experienced this Uh, the revelations, your understanding. I want you to go in the next 30 seconds and just list something in the chat that you have experienced something about the goodness of God. And I must say, I'm glad for each of you tonight that continuously are in this study. I am so pleased to tell my fellow bishops and pastors Yes, we have meditation every week. We have Bible study every week. And many don't miss. And for that, your life is enriched. And I'm happy to report that um, you're on the right road. You're on the right road. So glad you're in the study tonight. It's going to be time well spent. Something in your life that um, you've experienced about the goodness of God. I'm gonna give you about another 20 seconds to do that. And while you're uh, doing that, I'm going to just, I'm going to observe something you've experienced about the goodness of God. Something you've experienced about the goodness of God. Um, Matthew chapter 26, it's an interesting, and sobering prediction about the leader of the disciples, Simon Peter. And I want you to observe this conversation um, in verse 31 of Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 31. Um, Sister uh, Michelle Johnson, can you look up that passage and get ready to read that for us? Matthew 26 and verse 31. I want you to be putting your expressions of something you've experienced good about God. I want you to do that. Uh, I want you to be a part of this study. You, you're going to glean so much more when you um, make your contribution. Matthew 26 and verse 31. All right, Sister Johnson, read the book. And they're going and unmute, going and unmute. Sister Michelle Johnson, can we unmute her? All right. Are you yes, sir. Hello. Praise here. the Lord. There we are. Okay. Yes, sir. Matthew 26 and 31. Mm -hmm. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock 
shall be scattered abroad. Read on. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter mm -hmm. answered, mm -hmm. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Mm. Read. Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also said all the disciples. And I want you to come down to verse um, of the same chapter, um, verse 52, 51, verse 51. Okay. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Think not, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus must be, thus it must be, excuse me. Come on down to verse 71. We see now the chopping off of the ear by Peter with the sword after saying he would never deny the Lord. And then Jesus heals the servant's ear and reattaches his ear and has a, um, Correction for Peter. Now it comes to ver come to verse 71. This is all in Matthew 26, chapter 26, verse 71. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto, unto them that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And he, excuse me, and again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. He would have been lying, wouldn't he? Yes. Certainly. And then verse um, 73, mm -hmm. 73rd verse. Here's going to be the third time that he denies the Lord. Now, he just got through denying him, swearing. I not mm -hmm. only do, am I not his disciple, I never did know him. Wow. The same one who said, I will never deny you. Verse 73. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely thou also art one of them for thy speech be trayeth or bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear saying, I know not the man and immediately the cock crew. And Jesus remembered the word of Jesus, excuse me, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, we're going to be guided by this episode or series of episodes of gaining and loss in the life of Peter. Let me, let, me, let me see if I can pull up what I have discovered that you said about the goodness of God. What is good about God's goodness? Uh, someone said his healing. That's something good about the goodness of God. Keep in my mind. Wow, that is the goodness of God. He's a mind keeper. Health, health 
the health that we have in our body and our soul and spirit, that comes as the goodness of God. Um, another saying says, blessed my family, family progress and goodness is an expression of God's blessing, even on the family. He's been mindful of me and my family. That's God's goodness. Uh, my conversation, how the Lord allows me to talk and act with others. Some people call that testifying or witnessing, to be able to tell others of his goodness. That's the goodness of God. He is a healer. Lift your hand, somebody, and just say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. I know him as a good God in healing. Protection, his protection. Nobody can protect you <laughs> like the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Uh, God is faithful. Well, that's loaded right there. You said, God, you got faithful. Um, those are some, and if you have, if you did not get a chance to put your um, statement in the list, I want you to do it before we finish. I want to recognize everybody who has something good that you've experienced about the goodness of God. Um, when you think about what we call the wealth, divine wealth, and we got to reiterate this as we're studying what the scripture says about uh, money and how that applies to us, um, wealth is never limited to the currency of finance, a very common and worldly a misunderstanding that the more money, the more wealth, and the less money, the less wealth by any means necessary. Um, wealth comes in so many forms, and it is a very worldly, erroneous understanding to think it only is measured in money. In fact, some people are wealthier with less money. Some people do better with less money. Uh, and that's because wealth is, first of all, spiritual. I think you want to consider that in first, uh, in the third John. Go to the New Testament letters of John, John number three, not the third chapter, but the third letter right before the book of Revelation. Go to third John, the third letter of John, and verse two. And you'll see how wealth or prosperity is categorized. Verse two of third John, if you got it, just say, I got it. Beloved, talking to the saints, those in the covenant, the beloved of God, the family of believers, beloved, I wish above all things that you may continuously prosper. Mayest includes the focus on the continuation. You're already prospering. So he assumes the saints are already enriched. But I'm praying that in every area, you will continue to prosper and be in health. Once you're healthy. But the gauge of that is soul wealth, even as your soul prospereth. So your soul or your spiritual wealth is most important. Your sense of contentment, your sense of destiny, 
That's your wealth, your awareness of purpose for your life, holy self-satisfaction. Yeah, um, godliness with contentment is great gain. Sense of internal calm and boldness in him. Not in yourself, but in him. That's wealth. Uh, not just having fun, but having joy. The rivers of joy, the assurance. I'm about to get happy right now. I mean, you, many of you already mentioned it, healing. That's wealth. Yeah, an awareness of your call. Let me show you a book that I've just read, reread recently. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see what this says? The title of this book, I want you to see it. Let me put it there. What does it say? Is it right side up? Is it upside down? It's right side up. It's right side up. What's the say today as you read it? Oh, Called to be Saints. Wow. A little book that a sister from New York wrote years ago while we were um, ministering together on the foreign field. Wow, that's wealth. A sense of call to know your identity in this confusing and mad world to know you've been called for God's special purpose. He chose you to be a particular vessel for his honor. That's, that's your wealth right now. I mean, that's your wealth. A prayer life is wealth. Do you, you know what is wealth? Being humble, a sense of meekness. That's, that's wealth. Blessed, the poor in spirit. Peter didn't have that as a strong suit. Blessed, the um, merciful. People that have mercy are blessed and wealthy people. Blessed are the meek. The book says they have an inheritance of the earth. That's well. All those beatitudes. When your heart is pure and you know your heart is pure, free of jealousy and covetousness and hate and um, wickedness and envy and um, uh, free of backstabbing, <laughs> free, free of indifference. You wish the well-being of people, even those that don't have it, you really desire that their life is improved. Pure-heartedness, that's your wealth, brother. That's your breath, sister. That is your wealth. Peacemakers, not always in confusion and chaos and stirring up trouble and in the midst of uh, mama drama, baby drama, brother mama, sister drama. Peacemakers, you're able to bring reconciliation and not care. Spiritual wealth is number one. And while your spirit is prospering, that is assumed, even as your soul prospers, John says, I want you to prosper in other ways above all things and be in health. And so when we talk about wealth or prosperity, never consider that unchristian or dirty words or carnal or the expression of those that are unspiritually minded. No, according to the New Testament, spiritual wealth qualifies you for other aspects of it. Spiritual wealth qualifies you. Spiritual wealth, and we're learning how our spiritual wealth will free us from the wealth that the world focuses on that is very often separated from the wealth of the spirit or the wealth of the soul. Aren't you glad? I, I, I mean, I, I, just, I just sense most of you that are in this meditation tonight are not haters. 
of other people. Uh, do you know that's a blessing that you don't have hate? You may have been hated, but even if you are hated, your wealth is you're not a hater. In fact, you can hate the sin and love the person who's the sinner. I'm going to say that again. That's wealth when you can hate the sin in other people. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you, I know the trial isn't over. I know that the defense has not presented or rested their case. I know the jury has not given their verdict. But when George Floyd lost his life that day, that was wicked. And I'm not trying to taint the jury pool. We knew it was wicked before the trial even started. Uh, and though George Floyd was far from perfect, that's, that's not to me anything that is newsworthy. Um, he had flaws in his life. Uh, he had made choices along the way that were not all righteous. That does not justify someone in the name of law enforcement and keepers of the peace to snuff his life out that day and do that under the badge of law enforcement and justice. That was wrong. That was wrong. And uh, if justice is to be served, um, there's going to have to be some verdict and some sentence that will be an example that his life uh, was worth much more than the way it was so recklessly and brutally uh, terminated. They killed that man in front of numerous, numerous witnesses. I think the officer that's on trial's name, his name is Chauvin, Chauvin. But do you know that you still have to wish the best for him? If you're wealth, everybody's not that wealthy. Everybody, everybody's not that wealthy. But wealth is when you know that from all indication, he has blood on his conscience, blood on his hand, and left that man on the gutter of Minneapolis calling on his God and calling for his mother. No way that's right. But the man who did that, God loves him. The man who did that, Jesus died for his sins. The man that did that, by all means, should pay his debt to society. And because he can be forgiven, does not mean he's exonerated. <laughs> that would be dishonoring the life of George Floyd. If they just said, okay, sorry, let him go and try to be better next time, that would devalue the life of George Floyd and all of those persons associated with him. But because what happened to him was wrong doesn't mean you hate the man who did the wrong. Because the love of God is greater than the evil of man. And see, that's why I don't like to go too far because I'm about to get happy right now. I want you to say, please say that again. Just say it, please say that again. No, I want you to say it with me wherever you are. The love of God is forever greater than the evil of man. It's greater. The love of God is greater. So your wealth is great when you can hate evil and yet love the evildoer. And because you love them doesn't mean you give them a pass. Because you love them doesn't mean that you um, waive all consequences. Because you love them doesn't mean you agree or you concur. You may have to love them enough to speak truth to power and say, that's wrong, that's unrighteous, that's poisonous. But even in that, wealth 
begins in a heart that is pure. And if God loves anybody, he loves everybody. I say he loves everybody. The violence of sinner, Jesus gave his life for. And the one who thinks they are the straightest arrow and the goodiest, goodest, the goodest, goody, goody. See, no, the goodest, goody, goody, Mr. Goody, goody, Miss Goody, goody. All right. The goodest, <laughs> the very best goody, gooder, goody. All y'all, he loves you too. <laughs> it reaches to the highest mountain. Come on with me. It flows. That's where Chauvin is. That's where the cop is that put his knee on his neck for nine minutes. But yet it flows where all of us have been at some time in our history. It flows to the lowest valley. That blood, go on and say it, it gives me strength. From day huh, to day, wave your hand and say, never, 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 never. It will never, ever lose its power. Clap your hands and give God some praise. Go on and give God some praise. Ooh so back to Matthew in his wealth. In chapter, um, where were we? 20, um, 26. Chapter 26. I want you to consider with me what in the world caused Peter to lose it. Now, he's one of the 12 disciples. Uh, I wanted to stop by um, verse. Um, 14 of chapter 26, just in passing. And you see Judas is already being disqualified. He's one of the 12, Matthew 26 and 14. And he goes unto the uh, politician of the day, the chief priest, a crook. And he says, I want to get a bribe. How much will you pay me? if I turn Jesus over to you to be killed. Wow, how low is that? He went to them. They didn't have to go search him out. One of Jesus' 12 closest friends, a, a member of his church. Now, uh, rave your hand or go to the chat if you think you're a good member of our church. If you think you're a good member, I want you to go to the chat and just say, that's me, I'm a good member. I think I'm a good member. And I'm gonna look over and see if you told the truth. Jesus had 12 of his best members, his best. One of them was Judas. Oh my goodness. I just don't believe we have anybody that is in that category at the historic Boone Tabernacle. I just don't believe it. I just don't believe, no matter how much you may disagree, how much you may not uh, appreciate what you don't understand, uh, what your preferences are, I just don't believe you believe I would ever betray you. And if you believe that your pastor, this one, this one right now who's teaching you, would ever do anything intentionally to harm you to the extent of betraying you, that means you're not a very good member. If you think I would treat you that way, you got me all wrong. Jesus had 12 followers and Judas was supposedly one of the best. And if this is the best, Lord have mercy on anyone that could be worse. And he goes to the chief priest and cuts a deal to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And verse 16 says, from that time, 
Judas started plotting, seeking, looking for opportunity to sell Jesus into his death. That's, that's bad. Um, let me see. I think they actually gave him some of the money. Eventually, he got it all. Is that, is that the most you think or the least you think of the one who came to give your life wealth? And I mean, I want you to see how Judas equated the value of himself with 30 pieces of silver. Um, according to the Old Testament, that is the price, the standard price for a slave. That was the standard price. It could go up, it could go down, but the basic price for a person to be sold into slavery was 30 pieces of silver. And so he has now cheapened himself as such an immoral person that he will sell the freedom of another human being and of all people, the one human being that can save him. That's how low he treats the one that has made his life enriched. 30 pieces of silver and begin to look for opportunities to betray Jesus. Now that's Judas. He's supposed to be the worst of the 12. But I wonder, do you think that Peter was much different? And so Jesus says in verse 33 of Matthew 26. Um, I know that this is not going to go well, and you all are going to all abandon me. Uh, the shepherd will be smitten and the sheep will be scattered, but I will rise again, and I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Verse 33, Peter said, not me, baby. You're not talking about me. Everybody else may um, abandon you, um, but I will never be offended. I will never leave you. I will never fall away. That word offend could be rendered fall away from you. I will never. Others may. If there's somebody who sold you for 30 pieces of silver, that's him. But me. Uh, I'm cut from a different cloth. I will never offend you. Let me pause right there. Do you think Peter meant that at that time? Do you think Peter actually meant, I will never, ever abandon you, turn on you. I will never dog you out, throw yes. you under the bus. Yes, he meant it. Yeah. You believe he meant it? Yes. Why, why do you think he meant it? Tell me why you think he meant it. What, what makes you think he meant that when he said that, especially since he didn't live that out? What do you think? What makes you think he really meant that? You talking to me? Yeah, the one who told me, yeah. <laughs> I think he meant it because he believed it. He believed he believed that he loved Jesus so and that he was so close to Jesus and that he knew Jesus and uh, he knew the type of person Jesus was. And, uh -huh. and he just felt like, you know, um, I'm not gonna let anybody hurt you and I'm not gonna ever leave you. I'm not gonna ever, I'm not gonna ever uh, uh, walk away from you because he was saying that out of the way he emotionally felt at that moment. I think he really meant that. He just didn't know. Uh, he knew he knew Jesus, but he didn't know himself. I want to get that again. Why did you? What what makes you believe he really meant it? What was it that indicates? Because really he had he had he had dropped his net to follow Jesus. He had been mm -hmm. with Jesus three years. Right. And and he had seen the things that Jesus had performed, the miracles. He had, he had walked with him 
And he did believe that he was the son of God. He just didn't know the death that Jesus, he just didn't know the road Jesus had to travel and what all of that meant. He did not know that. Okay. And he, did, he, didn't, he didn't know how those people were going to turn on Jesus and <laughs> all that was going to happen. And he he didn't he really didn't know. I don't think he knew that Jesus was going to be crucified and betrayed like that. I, I don't think he knew that. He 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 didn't he didn't that was all right. Good, 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 good. All right, Sister Scott. Uh, Sister Scott, Sister Yolanda Scott, you believe that he meant it when he said, I will never be offended. I will never leave you. I will never change. Others may, but I won't. I'm with you forever. You believe that. What makes you think that? Why do you believe that he meant it? Sister First Lady, she said because he'd been following him for a long time and it left his life of fishing to follow him. And so he put in some time with it. Sister Scott, what makes you think he actually believed in him and meant what he said because like first lady said he had been with jesus and he followed him he trusted him he valued jesus's uh opinion and he valued what jesus stood for and i believe that he really loved him and sometimes things happen to people you know you say you love somebody you're gonna be with them but circumstances i don't know he just got he just got his caught up in a trap. The enemy set a trap for him. And he <laughs> hey, him. Hey. But he valued Jesus and he valued Jesus' opinion and he trusted him. You know, that's kind of like us. We value Jesus and we trust him and yet we've never seen him, but we follow him. Peter had a chance to see him and live the live in that era with Jesus. So he got to see a lot of miracles. And who want to turn on somebody like that? We value him and we've never seen him. And I don't want to turn on him. I trust him. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 34, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you have your Bibles, Jesus said, verily. That means truth. I'm about to tell you the real truth, Zeus. Now you talking, that's what you're feeling. That's your impression of yourself. That's an idea, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me, not once, not twice, thrice. Not before you die, not before I die, but tonight, the same, this same evening, there'll be three separate occasions where you will not only step away, but you will adamantly deny any association with me. Now, I gotta ask you another question. We're going somewhere. I'm trying to, trying to show you how wealth is so needed. Why do you think that Jesus singled out Peter? I'm coming to you, Dr. Barnes. Come to you, Dr. Barnes. Oh, we got two Dr. Barnes. Okay, I'm coming to both of you, Dr. Barnes. Why do you think Jesus was so directly responsive to the statement of Peter? Now, all the disciples were there together. Um, apparently, even Judas was. He'd made the deal with the chief priest but he was still waiting for the opportunity. So he'd already made the plan, but he still was showing up and being blessed 
by the one that he had plotted against. Jesus in the midst of this group of disciples says, you wrong. The truth is you way wrong. Mm -hmm. Tonight, before the night is over, the rooster's gonna crow. And uh, before he happens twice, I'm telling you in the midst of all the other 11, you're gonna deny me three times. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Sister Barnes, why do you think Jesus responded that way? I think he wanted uh, Peter to recognize what was in his, what was in his heart and what was in his spirit. Um, I know sometimes people make a, a statement and they'll say, I would never do such and such, or I would never, you know, I'm very careful about saying what I would never do because without being faced with certain things or in certain situations, you sometimes yourself, you don't know what or how you would, re, uh, would react. So I think that Jesus wanted him to recognize, you know, you still have maybe some areas that you're not quite totally confident in. You know, you think you are, but I want you to realize maybe you have additional places of growth, um, some other things you need to come up in. And so I, I, because Jesus cared about him, he wanted him to do better and he wanted him um, to know that about himself. So, um, uh, Sister Brown, hey, Sister Brown, Sister Monia Brown. If, yes, sir. Would this help you if you got that kind of response about something that you had boldly overestimated yourself in? Let's say that was a response that would have come to a person like you in a situation where you really believed you were more advanced. Um, Sister Barnes says areas that you needed to grow in and you didn't know. Would that help you to get a response like this from someone who knew you? I'm sorry, Bishop. I missed the the that part of the conversation on multitasking. I apologize. Okay, for Jesus told Peter, yeah. "You'll deny me three times." Would that help you if you got that kind of a response? Yes, sir. I suppose it would, but it would frighten me a little, or I would be a little concerned because I wouldn't want to believe that. Um, that that would be true about me. Um, but yes, sir, it would help me. But then I would know, I guess at that point, Peter knew that he really was the Christ. If he was not, um, if he had any doubt, it was, it was confirmed at that time. All right, all right. Someone said that he was scared. One of the saints said he was scared. Uh, Brother Barnes. Why do you think Jesus responded to Peter like that? Uh, um, Bishop, I believe there's several reasons why. Um, one was, um, it was stated earlier that, that Peter did not totally know himself. Right. Uh, spiritual walk. Um, and he was, and, and Jesus also, this was an apprenticeship for them. He stated there were certain things like fasting. There were certain things about casting out devils and so forth that they weren't going to be able to do. So he knew there were some areas where he needed to grow in. And he knew, and, and, and Jesus and his um, omniscient and his wisdom knew that we would need another example to sometimes highlight our areas where we need to grow in Christ. Um, he knew that. So he, he, he used, I feel like he used Peter as an example of, um, where we don't want to have shortcomings as a Christian. We want to be stronger. Yeah. Um, Peter probably meant well. But because you mean well doesn't mean you are well. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. And Jesus knew that he had miscalculated his own spiritual wealth. Amen. He thought he was in better spiritual shape than he was. Uh, Brother Barnes, since you're there, would you just reread verse 35 of Matthew 26? And we're, we're gonna, we got a few more passages we're gonna get to before we wrap it up tonight. But this is gonna be where we're going to uh, hang our hat for a long time. Verse 35, Jesus said, no, man, not only are you going to be offended, you're going to deny me most of the night. Almost all night, you're going to be denying me. Three times. That, that's, that's not a long period of time before the cock crows twice. You're going to be denying me three times. And when Jesus said that, Peter had a comeback. Peter, Peter refuted it. What Jesus has said. And what did he say in verse 35, Brother Barnes? Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also said all the disciples. Up, 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 up. Sometimes when the Lord is correcting you, he's correcting others at the same time. I want you to write this down in your notes and somebody put it in the chat. Um, everybody has struggles that they are unaware of. Uh, Peter didn't know he was lying. He was lying. But he didn't know he was lying because he did not know how inaccurate he was about his own wealth. We're talking about wealth, not just Judas. But here is a man who is so off the mark about who he is and really who Jesus is. But it wasn't just him. All the disciples had the same mistake. The difference is, What's the difference, Brother, Brother Barnes, is you there? What distinguished Peter in this episode from the other disciples? He did deny Jesus, and the other ones did not. Um, they all had the same sentiment. Verse 35 says, likewise also said all the disciples. They said they would die with him and not deny him, but Peter said it first. He said it first. Peter was more dramatic. Peter was more bold about it. You want to go a little deeper? He had more arrogance. He was more proud. He was more self-righteous. They all said the same thing. And a lot of times, other people are have the same struggle you have. They just don't advertise it. <laughs> don't, don't think because Andrew didn't say it, he did not feel that way. Doubting Thomas, he felt the same way. He just didn't say it first. They all concurred with Peter. Matthew, the tax collector, he felt the same way. He just didn't say it. They overestimated their spiritual strength and underestimated their personal struggle. They underestimated their own struggle. And I'm trying not to get to the end of this, but you need to follow the Lord closely enough until... Mm, he can show you struggles that you're not even aware of. Um, Sister Madden, can you help us with this? What do they say is the emotion that precedes anger? 
See if you can help us with that. We're taught that anger is often or usually a secondary emotion. And do you know what that usually is related to that often is even deeper than anger? There's another emotion. What you think about that, Sister Madden? All right. Let me, let me, maybe I'm not able to catch her tonight. I don't know, because I'm pushing all these buttons. All right. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to somebody else. I'm gonna go to somebody else. I'm gonna go to you. I'm gonna go to you, uh, Sister Valerie Jones. Can you tell us there's another emotion? Anger is powerful, it's a strong emotion. But there's another emotion that is deeper than that. And anger usually is an expression of another emotion. Do you know what that is? Well, um, so would it be the opposite of anger? No, but it's, it's different. It's related. It's not the opposite. Oh, it's related. So not love. I don't know, Bishop. That's good. We're going to get there tonight. I'm, I'm coming a little closer to you. I'm going to come a little closer. All right. All right. Let me, let me, let me see. Let me see uh, who else knows what is deeper, deeper, deeper than anger. All right. I always want to give Missionary Julia a chance. Missionary Julia, here's your chance. Do you know the emotion that precedes anger? Going once, going twice. You're about to learn something tonight in addition to the other. The emotion that precedes anger is pain or hurt. Yeah, hurt. Oh, we got it? All right, we got it, all right. Anger is real. Anger I was going to say deep. rejection, Bishop. Is that uh -huh. close? Thank you. No, no. I mean, it can be. It can be. But uh, pain is an emotion. Hurt is an emotion. There's all kinds of things that can contribute to that. Sure. Embarrassment, abandonment, right. Right. Um, loss. Um, uh, that that can all be a source of pain. Um uh, actually, if you really want to be more precise, it often is related to fear. Fear and pain are the primary emotions of which anger is the result. So I'm angry at you because of something that I've been hurt by, either from you or somebody before you even showed up. So everybody has the ability to be angry. How many of y'all have been angry already this year on some occasion? Raise your hand. If only for a few minutes you had some anger this year, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. You're telling the truth. Do you know there are some people that are so angry they won't even admit it? They will tell you when they're angry. I'm not mad. I'm not angry. <laughs> they, they are so far removed from their imperfect state that they will deny that they are angry when they are blowing smoke out of their ears. Of course, you do know you can be angry and be quiet. You know what they say in the woods, you gotta watch those quiet types because there's no anger like internalized or suppressed or unexpressed anger. So everybody has some capacity for anger. And guess what? So does God. 
Watch it, watch it, y'all, watch it, watch it, watch it. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. However, God's anger, unlike ours, is perfect. It is holy. And there might be some pain there because no one has been more offended than God himself after all he's done for us, after all he's done for humanity, after all, it, all those things you put in the chat that are good about his goodness, God has been offended. The spirit of the Lord has been grieved, Ephesians 4 tells us. The book says it has repented God. It has touched his heart. The whole spirit of God has been, has been grieved by the wickedness and the hypocrisy and the waywardness of the creatures that he loves so much. But God's anger is perfect. Uh, it is holy. It is justifiable. And it's never out of control. He doesn't have tantrums. He doesn't just lose it. But his anger is a righteous anger. Ours often is not. So when Jesus was correcting Peter, he was not insulting him. He wasn't just trying to make him feel bad. He was actually giving him some truth about a dangerous area in his life. This was an area of struggle that Peter did not even know. You might say he was in, what's the D word? Denial. And whenever we think that we are A-OK -okay in every area, we need to hear the Lord saying, you wrong. I'm going to tell you the truth. You got some struggles. You may not have the same struggle you used to have, but every human being has some kind of struggle. And the one person who can help you with it, go on and lift your hand and just say, I know him. Lift your hand and say, I know him. Lift your hand and say, I know him. There's one person who can help you with your struggle, but the first step is for him to convince you you need his help. And for Peter, it did not come easy. Now, can we go a little further on it? Let me see how I'm doing here. Because we go, I got about two more scriptures I want you to get on this losing what he had gained. Now we go down again in chapter 28 of the gospel of Matthew. And let's see what happens in um, verse 48. There's Judas giving him a kiss of betrayal. Wow. Judas used to be a believer. Judas, Jesus told him, your name is written in heaven. It used to be. Judas used to preach and teach and heal. Judas used to cast out devils. And now he is using a kiss to set Jesus up. That's the signal. Now's the time for you all to seize him and illegally arrest him. That's Judas. But he's not the only one who is in great spiritual deficit. So we go to verse 58. And there's Peter. He's sitting with the servants, sitting with the servants. 
afar off. Verse 58 says, Peter followed him afar off. Um, you have any idea why he was following Jesus afar off? You got any idea on that? There's a reason he was following afar off. Okay, keep going, keep going. And we come down to um, verse 67. This is not a happy day for Jesus. He's been uh, illegally and innocently arrested by the authorities. Uh, he's been taken away. The disciples have distanced themselves and now they're spitting in his face, beating him with their fist. Uh, slapping him with their hands, open-handed face slaps, mocking him. And when all this happens, 69 verse, Peter is on the scene. While they are mocking him, while they're spitting on him, while they are threatening him, while they are whipping him, while they are slapping him, while they are plummeting him with their fist, Peter, in verse 69, was sitting outside, and a damsel said, you are with that Galilean. I know you were with Jesus of Galilee. And verse 70, he denied before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. Wow. I got to ask you what happened to Peter. After saying, I will never deny you. I will never be offended by you. I will never leave you. What happened? What do you think happened? Brother Atkinson, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Thank God. Atkinson has been on his bed of affliction, and I'm so glad you came through and you're in this meditation tonight. Uh, let's clap our hands and praise God for Elder Atkinson. We're glad for you. Amen. I would ask you that question, Elder Atkinson, but I know you recuperated and I want you to save your strength. But Elder Williams, Elder Williams, what happened to Peter that he had such boldness, such courage, spoke in such glowing terms, and just an hour or two later, he is denying and say, I don't even know what you're talking about. What happened? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I, I believe Peter, uh, it was easy to say what he said uh, what, without experiencing later on what Jesus was going to experience. And uh, uh, there was no, um, how do you say, there was no, um, uh, nothing going on as far as what he envisioned, what he envisioned, what uh, Jesus had now had gone through while he was uh, being beaten and whipped and talked about and spat on. Um, the Bible says that he followed even Jesus, uh, uh, he followed him from afar. He was afraid because He's now seeing what Jesus is now going through. He didn't envision that before when he said, I will never leave you. I'll follow you. In other words, to the end of the earth, I love you. But then now when he saw what Jesus now was experiencing, the tables are now turned because he's now fearful for his life. And he didn't even want to be associated with him because of what he's now going through because he's fearing for himself. He's now seeing the manifestation of the love that Jesus has for us, but he didn't want to experience that himself. So um, I believe that's what happened. That's what the, you know, the, the going got rough and he got going in other words. Mm. Yeah, because of what he saw. Um, someone said he followed at a distance because he did not want to be recognized. Yeah. He did not, Elder Williams, 
it sounds like you're telling us he did not want to be associated with the one he said he would never be disassociated. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's because circumstances have changed. When he said, yes, I will never deny you mm -hmm. and I'll even die with you. Yeah. I'm never going to leave you. Mm -hmm. That's before the uh, rubber met the road. That's yeah. before life happened. Exactly. That's before he actually had to experience what he had never experienced. Um, experience is quite a, is quite a um, um, litmus test. It's, it's one thing to talk to talk. It's another thing to, uh, to um, walk the walk, isn't it? So he's now, now I want you to notice in this first betrayal, um, Elder Williams, it is a young lady. Yeah. Um, a servant girl. She's low on the social ladder. Mm -hmm. She has no real authority. She works very hard for very little yeah. um, compensation. Mm -hmm. How much of a threat could she be? Mm. Well, she could and open. She's the one that said, I saw you yeah. with Jesus. You know what? Somebody is watching you that you may not know. That's right. This, yeah. this is this is this is the second time Peter has a moment of truth. First of all, um, he overestimated himself mm -hmm. and said he would never deny the Lord. Now he's not aware that this inconspicuous young working girl mm -hmm. who they would consider a nobody. She's been watching Peter. Why? Yeah. Because she's been watching Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and guess what the second denial is? The second denial mm -hmm. um, comes on verse 71. Elder Williams, can you read verse 71? Absolutely. This is denial number two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 71 said, and when he was gone out into the porch, another maiden saw him and said unto them that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Uh-oh. <laughs> another hardworking, underclass mm -hmm. young lady. Yeah, now, they believe that uh, women were not as valuable as men, mm -hmm. and they believe that um, younger women were not as valuable as older women, and they believe that poor younger women mm -hmm. were not as valuable as. Um, uh, well-off younger women. In other words, this is the lowest rung of the ladder mm -hmm. in their estimation. That's not the yeah. way God saw them, but that's the way the culture did. So here is another maid, and that word means really a slave. But not something. Went from a servant to a slave, and she said, mm -hmm. listen, as one slave to another, <laughs> This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. The first lady, the servant says in verse 69, mm -hmm. Jesus of Galilee. This woman says Jesus of Nazareth. Yes. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Nazareth was a village in Galilee. Mm. So we're getting specific. Yeah. He's not only from Galilee would be considered by some um, the north. He's not only from the poor part of the nation. He's from one of the poorest parts. Nazareth was so impoverished that the question was, can any good thing 
come out of Nazareth. That was the most unrespected, the most economically depressed, the most uneventful. Uh, I, I don't know what the I don't know what the least admired town is in our area. I'm trying to think what would it be. Um, let me see. Let me see. It wouldn't be the plaza, not the plaza. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be the plaza. Uh-uh, no. This would be like outside of the city, uh, outskirts of the city. She is all the way at the most economically wanting strata. And even she says, Peter, I think I can say this to you because you've been around the man that loves everybody that helped anybody, that healed people, that advocated for the oppressed, that cleansed lepers. So you stand out because you were with him. And he said, what was his answer, Brother Williams? In verse 72. Uh, 72. He, and when he was gone out into, okay. So 72 says, and again, he denied. Again, again. Again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Wow. <laughs> so he got serious with that one. <laughs> now he gets to he gets to swearing mm -hmm. and says, I told you in verse 71, mm -hmm. I told that lady over there, I don't know, I don't know anything about him, and I don't know anything about what you're talking about. Okay, I thought that was the end of it. But as we go from verse 71, you got it? Watch that. Then you're gonna go to the second denial. So in verse um, 72, he denies again. Verse 70, he denied before them all. I don't know what you're talking about. That's when the damsel, the working girl, then when the maid, the slave girl, she says, I know that you were with Jesus of Nazareth, the little village. He denied this time with the oath saying, I do not know the man. Yeah, I don't God. know him. This is the closest man to him. And he says, I don't know the man. Now we go to the third deny, right? Verse 73, and there came, after a while, there came and stood somebody and said to Peter, you surely also are one of them. Jesus is not the only one. You're from that group. And I can tell from your dialect your dialect, you've got a Southern accent. You're not from, you're not from London. You, you, wait a minute, you're not from London, you from Oak Muggy. I can tell from your accent, quit acting all proper. And this time he said, oh, you think you heard proper? Listen to this. And in verse 74, what'd he do, Brother Williams? He said, uh, then began he, he, he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. Now, what do you think, what word do you think he used when he was cursing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he used some serious words. <laughs> yeah, this time he got, you know, he, he sounds like. Cursing you know, and swearing. Yeah. Cursing <laughs> and swearing. And swearing. <laughs> now, I'm going to come back to you, Brother Williams, on that. Why is he cursing and swearing, saying, I don't know the man, mm -hmm. after he had just said a few hours ago, I know him better than anybody. I'll never leave him. Why is he now cursing and swearing and out of control? What, 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 why is he doing that? I, I think still because of what he still, the position that he's in, in, uh, and the situation that Jesus is in, he's still witnessing what Jesus is going through. 
And again, when he even said to Jesus, you know, I'll never leave you, I'll be with you. The, it, it got real tough, you know, when, when Jesus was found out and who he was, and now he's getting beaten, whipped and everything. Jesus, Peter is uh, experiencing all of this. And so we come to this point in verse uh, 74 through 75, he's cussing and swearing now because someone else may be listening to those individuals who saying, surely you was this person that was with him. And so it draws a, it sometimes that type of information draws a crowd or draw other people's attention and every, all the attention is on him. So he has to fight off the attention and he's mad and he's frustrated now and cursing and lying at the same time. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think because now he's, you know, he's upset, he's afraid, the attention is drawing to him and he don't want it to be drawn to him because he's a fear, fearful of his life because what he may be uh, a subject to along with Jesus. And All so right. he's fighting now, you know, in other words. All right. I, I want to come to Sister Michelle Johnson. I want some help on this. What makes a man cuss and swear and lie at the same time? Can you tell us that, Missionary Johnson? What makes a man cuss, swear, lie all at the same time? What makes him do that? I would say fear and anger all of the above combined. Um, one thing too, she had said, said something about his speech. So instead of staying on the line where he normally would talk, he went a different way. <laughs> Have you ever known somebody to cuss, lie, and swear? I, mean, I, I think sometimes y'all have never been around that side of humanity. Have y'all ever known anybody to do that? Let, let me know if anybody has ever been in the presence of a man lying, cussing, and swearing. Uh, all right. Um, uh, Sister um, Scott, is that you? Uh, tell us, why do they do that? Why do they do that, Sister Scott? Sister Darlene Scott, can you tell us? What makes a man cuss and lie and swear all at the same time? Maybe because he's trying to get out of some hot water that he stepped into. <laughs> okay. She said he, maybe he was trying to get out of some hot water. All right, Brother Barnes, uh, you've been around somebody doing that. What, what cause is that? Now, remember, this was before this such a nice guy. He spoke in such reverential terms. He was a model citizen, except when he was cutting somebody's ear off. <laughs> what, what, what makes a man turn into this seething uh, monster so suddenly? What, what causes that to happen from your observation? He sticks into flesh, into bad, back into bad habits. He had been with the master and when he was there, kind of like some people there in church, they're saints. And then on Monday, they raise in sand. So he stepped out of his calling. Mm. Yeah, you're on the right road. Let me go a little further. Uh, what caused that to happen? I mean, it's not like people do that all the time, is it? I hope not. Yeah, what what you think caused him to step out of his calling and make such a dramatic uh, change? I, I I do think fear was some of it, um, but I think he he just um, I think out of sometimes you have to pause and your reaction, mm -hmm. um, you you have to pause and think and reflect on on God instead of getting back into flesh. Mm -hmm. Especially when he's so close, like Jesus was. Yes, he was real close. Um, it, it's amazing how quickly you can lose everything you gained when you depend on your own strength. 
It's amazing. Um, it's amazing how much harm we can be associated with when we forget how much we really need to depend on the Lord. See, when Jesus said, yeah, you're going to deny me three times, he was checking then Peter's self-reliance. He was telling him then, you have shifted from thinking because you've been around me that you can be me. Without me, you can do nothing. And though you've had all this power in your life and you've made such a change and you've received all of this spiritual wealth, not one moment, not one moment of your life is worth it without being dependent on the grace and the power of God. And look, I talked about the emotion of pain and anger. Verse 75, go to verse 75, verse 75, about to come on in. Uh, verse 75 of this same chapter. Verse 75, you got it? You want me to read it, Bishop? Please. Um, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Wow, what a conclusion. Now, since at, when the rooster crowed, um, he had a flashback and remembered the words of Jesus. What does that tell us happened before that? If he remembered now, what had occurred, Brother Barnes? He had forgotten. He had forgotten how soon we forget. That's one reason why Jesus told us to keep taking communion Amen. and having the Lord's Supper. He said, don't stop doing that because you need to continuously remember. You do this in remembrance of me. You would think that a person who is an upstanding individual, you would never have to worry about them doing something uh, wicked. But you can forget from where the Lord has brought you from. Never think that because you're standing now, you could never fall. I think I heard Sister Barnes say, be careful about saying what you would never do. Um, and Peter forgot what he had said and what Jesus had said. And what emotion do we see at the end of this as the rooster is crowing for the third time? What, what emotion do you see there at the end of that verse? Uh, Brother Barnes, what, what emotion is that? Uh, uh, re remorse. Mm -hmm. Yep. What was he crying about? What was he crying about? What do you think he was crying about? All right, now I'm gonna come back to Sister Valerie Jones. She been just stretching out. What was Peter crying about after he heard the rooster and he remembered the words of Jesus? What do you think was causing him to weep so bitterly? Now he was feeling, um, I think like Brother Barnes said, remorseful. He was sad that he had done those things after he said he wouldn't and now he saw what actually happened yeah so his heart was sad somebody says guilt mm -hmm. um, somebody is saying um the truth the facts it can be painful he I saw know. his own helplessness now, you, you think he was angry or was he, uh, was this anger or was this fear? Um, could it be both? He was maybe angry at himself 
um, for doing for mm-hmm. doing what he did. Mm-hmm. I don't know, and he could have been fearful too of what he thought was going to happen. What What did this show him about himself? As he remembered the words of Jesus in his memory, Jesus wasn't saying one word verbally, but in his memory, this is now just ransacking his conscience. Well, what did that make Peter feel about himself? <clears throat> Probably like any of, well, I won't say any of us, but um, if you had done something that you knew was wrong, I would think that your conscience would be, and you would just feel terrible, and your conscience would be um, He's broken hearted. Been, Mm-hmm. Deacon Jones said broken hearted. Yep. yep. He does not see himself in such glowing terms. Mm-mm. He's disappointed in himself. He's ashamed of himself. He's never seen himself in such a weak state. Um, he's conflicted. He does feel some fear. He doesn't want to die. This is not playing out the way he had imagined. When he said, I'll die with you, he didn't mean like this. So he sees himself not knowing what to do with himself. And then Jesus, Jesus in the other gospel records, he looked at him and loved him. Uh, I want to just give you that reference before we get there, before we close out tonight. Uh, Go back to Matthew uh, 26. And at that verse where he's weeping bitterly, I want you to consider one other passage. And um, mm. Bishop, may I ask you a question? Please do. Being the capital punishment, and that's what Christ had to endure was Mm -hmm. capital punishment. Being the capital punishment was common and they had, I assume that they had seen that before. Could it possibly be that they had heard of it and may have been far from it? And Peter had experienced it close up and personal for the very first time. Um, yeah, like you said, it was very common and it was a part of their law. It was a part of their religion, and he probably had seen people stoned, and um, the Roman Empire allowed for crucifixion. Uh, Peter carried a knife. Remember, he carried a knife, and in this episode, he demonstrated that he knew how to use it. He chopped off a man's ear just a few hours before that. And it's very possible he feared that if Jesus was being apprehended by the people that rendered capital punishment, if he was associated with him, he would be guilty by association. And he could be strung up next. So more than likely, he was fearing for his own life. Yeah. That's a that's a that is not an easy place to be in to love Jesus and then the consequences could cost you your life. Wow. Um, that's a good question, Sister Madden. He was certainly at a place he had never been before. Any, any way you slice it, this was a new experience for Peter. He had never been in that situation. Um, Sister Madden. Can you go to Mark chapter 16? I'm actually driving. 
Oh, don't go. Don't go there. Don't go there. You keep on driving. Let me let, <laughs> let me move on. Let me move on. All right. Um, uh, Sister uh, Scott, Sister Darlene Scott, can you read Mark 16? Mark chapter 16 and verse number nine. You see there, Jesus now um, is on Easter Sunday. What day of the week? First day of the week. That's why we still worship on Sunday because Jesus met with the believers on the first day of the week, the day he was risen. And the first person that we see listed is somebody with problems. Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast seven devils. Seven devils out. This is somebody with a lot of problems. But she was the first one that Jesus appeared to. If anybody knew they needed Jesus, it was Mary Magdalene, not Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's another Mary. If anybody knew that Jesus had to help her, she knew it. Peter hadn't had all those devils cast out. So he saw himself as much more self-sufficient than Mary. And so Jesus appeared uh, before Mary Magdalene first. That's amazing. And let's see what Jesus had to say. Um, Jesus said to them in verse seven, verse seven. All right, first lady, you got the Bible? Read verse seven of Mark 16, first lady. All right. Okay, I'll read it. But go your way and okay. tell. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly. Now that's good. Why do you believe Jesus told Mary Magdalene and the other women that saw him on this Sunday morning to tell his disciples and particularly Peter mm -hmm. to meet him. Mm -hmm. Why do you think why do you think he named Peter? Because he knew Peter felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> You, you you think because he cussed, he felt bad? No, because, because he, he denied he him. Bad. You think because he was swearing, he felt bad? And because he denied Jesus, he, 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 he had to feel some kind of burden of being a failure. You know, he had failed. And um, he didn't he didn't know how to rid himself of that, that burden of failure. Yeah. When he had so, he had so emphatically said that he wouldn't do that. That he would, he, he's, I go down fighting with you, I die with you, but I'm not going to deny you. And um, so he knew, and he knew that, he knew that. So, so the Lord sent out a special invitation to him. Yeah. Um, have any of y'all ever felt the shame, the guilt, the grief of failing somebody. Have you any of y'all ever felt that? Yeah. I'm talking about since you've been grown. I don't mean like you were little yes. crumb scatchers, some little. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about when you were a yappy. I'm talking about since you've been fully grown. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt mm -hmm. what it's like to know? You have failed somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
That's a bad place to be, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Jesus yes. knew how Peter was feeling. Mm -hmm. He knew what was in his heart. Mm -hmm. He knew what was in his mind. He knew where Peter was, even when Peter could not explain it mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, even when Peter didn't know where Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew mm -hmm. where Peter was. Amen. I got, we got to go, we got to go, but I Amen. gotta tell you, Jesus always knows. Oh, where you are. Where you are. He can locate you. Even if you're wrong. My God. Even if you're mad. Yes. Even if you are in pain. Yes. Even if you are secluded. Yes. Tell his disciples and Peter, the yes. one that lied, swore, lied. cussed, mm -hmm. took oath. Did it all night, mm -hmm. said, I don't even know him, mm -hmm. and wept in shame. Jesus knew where he was. And Jesus sent word to Peter, you're going to get back the peace that you lost. You're going to get back the joy that you lost. Tell Peter, meet me with the others. You're going to get back the power that you lost. You're gonna get back the relationship with me that you totally trashed. You're gonna get back the wealth that you lost. You had it, you lost it, but the wonderful thing about divine wealth and New Testament prosperity is the real wealth that you have lost. Jesus is the one that can bring it back. Amen, amen, amen. Now that's wealth. That was wealth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All praise God. I don't know if you can hear one another. I don't know if we can unmute one another, but I'm gonna see if everybody get, can get unmuted. And I want you not to talk to each other, but just take these closing seconds and just thank God for being the restorer. Sure. Sure. Restoration. Thank he you. restores my soul. Thank you. Bring so back the year that the canker worm and the thank caterpillar, the locust. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, just keep me Married to the backslider. Thank you. Okay, and okay. just keep me in your prayer. Give back your laws. He can bring it back to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on and shout hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 If he's ever given you your wealth back, just shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. And you know the good news is, after this occasion, you don't see Peter lying. You don't see him cussing. You never see him cuss again. You never see him swear again. He made some stumbles along the way, but you never see him back in that state. He was actually more wealthy afterwards than he was before. Get your offering together. Everybody get your offering together. Time is up. We've gone well into this evening studying in the life of Peter, how you can have it, lose it, and get so much more back. I don't have time to go to the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up full of the Holy Ghost and said, this is that which was prophesied by Joel in the last days, the Holy Ghost will be falling on all flesh and we are still receiving the wealth of the Holy Spirit that Peter announced after he got his wealth back. Uh, use the ca uh, cash app and uh, go on and do what you do. Give a good offering tonight, share us under the Lord. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll be in the class, but next Thursday, we'll resume Bible study. We're going to have the class for those that wish it on Wednesday, and then the meditation will continue tomorrow's Bible band. We're praying for Sister Janine Morrison, Sister Janine Morrison, um, who has been uh, hospitalized. We want the Lord to touch her, 
and want the Lord to strengthen her body and make her well as only he can. God is good. He's helping us. He's on our side. Our wealth is the wealth of spiritual prosperity first. And if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seek that first and all these other things shall be added unto you. Wave your hand and just say, I want it all. I want it all. I want it all in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. What a, what a great time to be in the word of the Lord tonight. And I'm glad to see wealth coming upon you. Uh, the materialistic, it will catch up with you. But what you have now by this episode is a reminder. God is going to load you with spiritual enrichment. If you will receive it, Jesus can give you life and he gives it to us more abundantly. He only takes away so he can replace it with something so much better. Thank you, Jesus. And we praise you tonight and we bless your name, Lord. Thank you for the gathering of the saints. All of these, your sons and daughters, praise God, mm -hmm, that have gathered around your table to hear your engrafted word. Thank you for caring enough to feed us with bread from heaven that will give us life forever. Let the word remain in our spirits. Let it remain in our hearts. Let the offering be blessed and the giving of it. Let it also be blessed. Give us joy in investing into your kingdom. Thank you for touching Elder Atkinson and bringing him again into restoration. And thank you for healing, healing, Lord. We claim the healing virtue of the one that gave his life for Peter and gave his life for the disciples for Mary Magdalene, and for each one of us. All that we need is in the covenant of the Lamb of God. And we go in your strength. May tonight be a peaceful and blessed one. And until we shall meet again, may we live in the comfort of your word and the power of the cross. Thank God. Amen and amen. God bless you, saints.